OK, I'm going to call the meeting to order. We uh, have a very fulsome agenda today, as I've talked about with Lisa and David. We're going to finish this meeting at noon, come hell or high water, because I have another board meeting that starts at 1230. So um, so we're going to have to move quickly. And if I cut you off, I apologize in advance, but we've got a lot of material to go through. A lot of approvals, not only capital projects and financial statements and the annual report and mm -hmm. auditor's fees. We've got a lot of things to go through and a lot of updates uh, on our major projects as well. So with that, I will read the land acknowledgement and call the meeting to order. Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that the land upon which we are undertaking our revitalization efforts is part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and that Toronto was covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. In addition, Waterfront Toronto acknowledges that Toronto has historically been a gathering place for many Indigenous people, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is home to many First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples today. So with that, um, can I get a motion? I'm going to look at you a lot, Jeannie, because you're sitting right <laughs> across from me to approve the agenda. And second, okay. Uh, any conflicts of interest anyone would like to declare? None. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lisa for the highlights. I've asked her to, you know, to take, and we're going to take a lot of things as read. Um, let me just give you some uh, highlights to start so that we can sort of streamline the efforts. We're going to take a lot of the, uh, the highlights of the key messages from Lisa. Um, she's going to hit on a, a few high points, the procurement report, the regulatory and operational compliance report. We're going to take the COVID update as read, uh, and then also the financial and administrative dashboard. Um, so we're going to try and, uh, there's nothing particularly controversial or, or even that new in any of those things, um, particularly the COVID update. Um, so um, we're going to take those all as read and try and keep moving along. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over. I think we need, first of all, uh, is it, any comments on the minutes of the uh, last meeting? I get a motion to approve those. Thanks, Jeannie. Seconded, okay. True, those seconded. Are, those are carried. And over to uh, you, Lisa, for any highlights on the, uh, on the uh, dashboard or the audit. Sure, thank you, Kevin, and good morning, everyone. So um, keeping in mind um, streamlining and taking um, key items is read. What I would like to highlight in under the macro dashboard section is under enterprise risk management, the dashboard that's on page 15 of your materials. I mean, I don't know if you move to that one. What I'd like to just highlight for the committee this meeting is that there are two risks on our dashboard uh, where we have that have reduced in terms of likelihood and or impact due to the mitigations that we've employed. Um, as by the corporation, and those two risks are liquidity risk and business continuity. You'll see them at the bottom of the table there. Liquidity risk has decreased in severity as a result of recently securing uh, tri-government consent to increase the corporation's borrowing facility by 50 million to 90 million, as well as the increase in that term of that uh, consent by five years to May 2028, which is to the end of our current mandate. And this provides this consent approval by the governments, provides the corporation with enhanced liquidity tools that reduce our cash flow risk. So that's um, the rationale why that risk has reduced. Uh, the second risk that's reduced that I'd like to highlight relates to business continuity. And this is reduced due, due to uh, the completion of a, of a major update or refresh to our business continuity plan, taking into account things that have happened like the pandemic. In the last two years, as well as different investments that we've made to support work from home, as well as now returning to the workplace in a hybrid format. So as a result, these two risks are no longer in our top 10 um, in terms of enterprise risks. And I thought this was an important um, matter to bring to the committee's attention. They still remain as risks in our top 20, um, but they're just no longer in the, in the top 10. So that was what I wanted to highlight on, with respect to enterprise risk. There was only one other item in, in the consent agenda that I wanted to highlight, Kevin. I don't know if there were any anything, just anything else that you wanted to touch on the consent agenda before we get to the ESG update. Uh, no, nothing for me. I have some comments in the we review the financial statements, but uh, okay. So, Jamain, if you can go to page seventy-two of the materials. So I wanted to highlight for the committee that this uh, ESG update is a new report that has been included based on feedback from the committee at the last meeting in February. 
And as noted at the top of the report, environmental social governance, ESG, is embedded into the corporation's mandate. So it has been something that we've always done. Um, now, with an increased focus on ESG matters um, by organizations globally, we wanted to report more deliberately in terms of the various initiatives that we have underway. So while this list is not exhaustive, it's also not cumulative, it really just outlines the current activities and some of the next steps. Our ultimate goal would be to eventually have a KPI dashboard of key ESG indicators that can be comparable to other organizations. This is a really a first draft. We welcome feedback that the committee may have um, now or subsequent to the meeting to make it more meaningful. And we also do intend to report this report or provide this report to the two other board committees uh, for information and their feedback as well. This is all included in the integrated annual report. This information is it any different from? Um, it's it it's it's in there. It's not in this consolidated format. This is like a two pager that really just highlights all the key um, ESG type um, initiatives that we have underway, whether it be under governance, whether it be under environmental or on, under social. But those items are in there. It's just not all in one little okay. short, um, summary like this. We also noted down the side on the report what committees uh, have oversight of those particular areas as well to be helpful. Okay. Um, questions on any of that? Any? Uh, I'm not meaning to gloss over any of this stuff because it's important, but it's all in the materials. But were there any questions arising out of the first section of our agenda today? Lisa, what's PwC doing? I know. I noticed we've hired them under the ESG. Yes, yeah, so PwC is helping us with the um, TCFD disclosure, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. Okay. Um, and basically what they did was um, assess us in terms of our um, all the different um, areas of the disclosure, which you'll see in the um, integrated annual report, our just first ever disclosure on that. They helped us develop that, write that, and figure out any gaps where we're going to work towards um, Further, further work to, to fully um, comply with that. Is so. this all budgeted? All this ESG it, it is. compliance? Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. So budgeted and covered to fund. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, we'll turn it over to David then for the capital projects update. Um, what are the highlights there, David? Uh, well, I think that um, we will be speaking in some detail to the uh, uh, Parliament's, uh, sorry, Parliament Portland uh, flood protection. I've got an update on the project as well as the update on the estimated completion risk. So I think that uh, unless there are questions um, on the uh, either of the dashboards, uh, we can we can move on. Okay, we'll deal with a lot more of that later. Um, let's go to the audited financial statements, which we are required to approve at this meeting. Technically, recommend them to the board for approval. I think, but um, uh, I'm going to ask my my colleague Samparish and Dane, who's on the she's in the office. She's just on the screen there. Um, she's going to provide a brief overview of our financial statements, and then we will turn it over to uh, Jeff Barrett and Rob Paws from BDO, who are our external auditors, to provide their presentation um, regarding the audit before we'll um, ask the farm committee con to consider recommendation for approval. So, Sampada. Uh, thank you, Lisa, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, these are the audited financial statements uh, for the fiscal year March uh, 2022. And as Lisa mentioned, my presentation will be followed by the uh, external auditors BDO's report uh, in terms of their process, procedures, conclusions, and finding on the statements. Uh, as I like to do um, uh, every, every quarter, I'd like to go through some of the key items, uh, especially if there have been significant changes um, in the numbers uh, from the past year. So, Shami, can you just... Uh, go to page number 78 of the material. Now, this is the statement of financial position. Uh, I'd like to uh, go through some of uh, like three or four items over here and the key drivers for the changes in those items. The first item that I would like to discuss is receivables. There's a significant change in the receivables. It's about 63 million up from what we reported as of March 20, uh, 31st, 2020, 2021. And that's in, uh, the most of the receivables, almost the entire 63 million is the provincial funding. 
um, uh, is, is as a result of the provincial funding for the uh, Portlands. Um, the composition of the 100 million is really, as I said, six, almost 68 million for the uh, Portlands contribution from the, uh, from the province and the rest of it city is a small portion of about 2.1 million uh, and the rest of it relates to the land closing which happened um, just prior to the fiscal year end that's about 60 uh, 61 million uh, sorry 15 million uh, and Sambara, Sambara, yes. we, rec we received that um, large yes. amount of from I the was just, I was just going to mention so in terms of the land closing, which you will see in the statement of financial activities as the revenues reported, we've actually received that just after March 31st. We received it on April 1st, actually. Uh, so that's also been received. Uh, so the only big outstanding item in the 100 million receivables is the provincial contribution uh, for the Portlands, which uh, all of the due diligence has been done on that. So it's just a matter of timing before we receive it. We should receive it uh, uh, before, hopefully before the end of this month. Uh, this next item that I would like to go to is restricted cash. Uh, a slight increase in the restricted cash as a result of the holdbacks, increase in the holdbacks. And this restricted cash is composed basically of the holdbacks, the construction holdbacks, as well as some of the other uh, contributions that we receive for public art, broadband, etc. The next item is the assets under development. Assets under development have increased by almost 245 million. And this is really our expenditures or our investments in Portlands as well as Lakeshore Bridge and other capital projects. Uh, again, next item is the capital assets. Uh, that has increased by 13.5 million. Uh, this year, uh, in February, we have acquired 11 Parliament Street, uh, which uh, is required for the Keyside development. Uh, so that, uh, that is uh, shown as land. Um, in the schedule as well. So that has resulted in an increase of 13.5 million over last year's number. And in, uh, in case of liabilities, if you go to liabilities and net assets, um, under current liabilities, we have accounts payable. There's a slight, slight increase. Uh, we have slightly higher accruals. We have accrued uh, for two months uh, of construction invoices instead of one month last year. But these accruals are standard um, given our construction activity in the Portlands. We have a deferred contributions of 60 million um, increase. Again, this deferred contributions is entirely as a result of Portlands. We are sitting on a slightly higher working capital uh, because some of the Portlands expenditures have been deferred to uh, future years. And therefore, there's an increase in deferred contributions. We will be drawing down on these deferred contributions as we go ahead with the project. Sharmin, can you just turn to page 79 of the material? I'd like to go through the statement of financial activities, just the key items over here, uh, in order to explain what's uh, the increase in revenues. Um, so in terms of the restricted revenues, the revenues have gone up by 73 million. Again, this increases completely as a result of the contributions for the Portlands. Uh, if you notice, uh, the contributions for the Portlands from the province of Ontario have gone up from 103.4 million from in last year to 155.5 million. This is just uh, basically uh, driven by how the funding agreements with the governments have been drafted. Their share, uh, province's share for fiscal year 21-22 was higher than uh, their share for last fiscal year. So entirely driven again by the uh, uh, Portland's contributions. City as well, um, driven a slight increase is as a result of the Portland's contributions, as well as city's contributions comprise of contribution of for projects like Lakeshore Bridge, York Street, etc. If, if we go down to the expenses, uh, you'll see expenses of 16.7 million this year. Uh, however, these are only the items which we are expensing through the statement of financial activities. If you just uh, look up at the government contributions of as for assets under development, you're going to notice that there's a 231.8 million. So really our total expenditures for the year is a combination of what we expense as expense for, uh, for financial activities uh, plus uh, our government contributions for assets under development um, and our expenses, total expenses for the year is in the region of 200 and um, sorry, I I have the number here, so like that. Uh, we've spent a total of 283 million this year. Um, we have land sale proceeds as well uh, of 15.4 million from a closing in East Bay front, from land sales in East Bay front. Uh, all that has resulted in our excess of revenues over expenses of 8.2 million, which flows basically through our to our unrestricted surplus through our retained earnings, to our retained earnings. I'd like to just look at one last item, which I like to uh, go over each year, uh, each quarter just to understand uh, how the net assets work. And Charmin, if you can just turn to page 87 of the material. Um,
which is note 12. Uh, there's two parts to note 12, 12A and 12B. 12B is uh, what our unrestricted surplus looks like right now. It's actually a deficit. Uh, now, this deficit is a result of all of those um, expenditures we are incurring from the future key side revenues. And uh, so you can see that the deficit, current deficit is about 47 million, but this deficit is going to turn into a positive um, when we receive our key side revenues uh, later this year. And this uh, this uh, unrestricted def deficit closes into our equity, which you will see in note 12A just above. Uh, net assets uh, as of today stand as of March 31st standard 1.2 billion, uh, which is main, mainly made up of, of the Portland's assets as well as our unrestricted deficit of 47 million uh, that is carried forward to that net assets. These net assets are going to deplete as it, as and when we transfer these assets out to the various governments. Uh, so at one point, the net assets will deplete um, upon transfer of assets to the governments. Uh, I had uh, this concludes my presentation, but if there is anything else that um, any questions that the committee may have, I'd be happy to address them. So in essence, we're we're borrowing forty seven million dollars against the the, key from the key side yeah. revenues. Which this uh, this borrowing is a notional borrowing because we have the pooling of bank accounts right now. So we've not actually tapped into our actual borrowings uh, mm -hmm. because of the pooling of bank accounts. We've got so cash which we are using to fund these expenditures. See the Portland's money. Yeah, so this is an accounting entry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it is. It's also cash flow management technique right. as well. Yeah. Is there any other land revenue coming in or is that it? And Keysight's the next one. There's a little side. Go ahead, Sampada. There's still more land revenue coming? There in? is, yes. There is uh, land revenue next year as well. Oh, okay. from, from Bayside, from Eastside. Yes. It's, it's not in the magnitude of yeah, but then that's it. it. And then it's Keyside. OK, yeah, that's right. and 11 Parliament, that's the RCYC lands. That's correct. No, 11 Parliament is not the RCYC land. 11 Parliament is 11 or, or maybe it is. Yes, yeah, sorry, my 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 bad. Yeah, our 11 Parliament is the RCYC land. Yeah, yeah. there is another piece of land uh, which we are closing on in June, uh, which is the Parliament slip. And if you look at, um, there is a note for subsequent event that has been included um, under note um, 25. 25, the last note, uh, which pertains to a land, um, uh, you know, parliament slip that we are closing on in early June. Okay. Um, any other questions on the financial statements? So obviously we're in, good health and good liquidity, which is good to see. I think we'll hear from our auditors first before we approve them. So that's Jeff, is it? Yep, Jeff is there as so is Rob. Okay, uh, welcome video. Jeff, thanks for attending. Thank good morning everyone. Report. Yeah, Lisa, I'm actually gonna speak. Rob's lost his voice, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna speak today instead. So okay. um, if you could just scroll to uh, to our letter in the package of materials, I'll, I'll walk the committee through that and feel free to ask any questions uh, during during my presentation or obviously at the end of the presentation. They're perfect. So so the letter uh, from myself and BDO to the committee, uh, part of the reporting process around the audit of the financial statements uh, required under CPA standards. There's information in this letter that uh, is not in the financial statements that you need uh, in terms of making your decision and judgment on approving the financial statements to the board for a full approval. Uh, continue on to the next page, please. I uh, keep going past the table of contents. So uh, the audit at a glance, so our preliminary materiality we reported at the uh, the February Farm Committee meeting was $4 million. Our final materiality remained unchanged from that preliminary assessment. Um, I did want to mention, um, given the, the large spend uh, of the corporation, both this year and in the, the next two years, according to the budget, our materiality could actually be much higher. It could have been as high as $7.8 million this year and could be as high as probably 12 ish million dollars in the future years, depending on the actual spend in fiscal 23 and 24. Um, I wanted to note this to the committee because the committee obviously has input into the materiality. One of the reasons we've left the materiality lower is because we do a, a fairly fulsome control testing uh, during our audit. It's not not relying heavily on substantive testing or analytical. Um, the main key is control testing. Uh, so as a result of that, the materiality doesn't really play into the efficiency or the volume of testing that we do. 
Uh, but also uh, one of the issues we would have in future years or the organization would have in future years is if we increase materiality to a level of let's say $12 million in fiscal 2024, and then in fiscal 2025, when the spending begins to decrease according to the budget, you're going to have an issue where the pre the previous year is not going to have been audited to the correct materiality. So you're going to end up having to go back and redo work in previous years if the materiality goes up too high. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, if anyone took the statements and, and did the mathematics of, of 3% times the asset under development spend and the expenses, you'd see $4 million is not the maximum. Um, and obviously the committee is welcome to weigh in um, going into fiscal 2020. Three's audit if they'd like me to increase the materiality, but just wanted to go over that and, and note that if we did increase the materiality too high, we could have an issue in, in future years audits. Um, so moving on from there, uh, we're not aware of any fraudulent activity uh, as a result of our audit. If anyone on the committee is aware of anything that I should be made aware of before I sign the financial statements, I'd ask that you either let me know right now or if it needs to be handled in private, please contact me afterwards. Uh, the status of the audit, um, we substantially completed our audit. There's a few confirmations that remain outstanding. Some of these may have actually come in since I prepared this letter for, for management over a week ago, but essentially we've got a few confirmations to come in. Uh, we need to sign a representation letter. We'll do our subsequent event review through to the statement date and then the official approval uh, from the board. Um, the scope of the work performed uh, remained consistent with what we reported to the committee in the planning meeting, uh, so nothing to discuss in terms of changes to our audit plan. Uh, you can continue on to the next page. So audit findings. So uh, as part of the, the process of BDO, we identify uh, areas of uh, significant risk of material misstatement, not because there's something that's happened at the organization, just because of the nature of the activity or the complexity of the transaction. So uh, the two ones we always talk about are management override of controls and revenue recognition. Those are standard uh, risks in any audit that, that BDO completes. Uh, so management or right of controls, we've talked about it in the past. Again, it's the fact that management can operate outside of uh, the processes and policies that are put in place in terms of the controls for a, a certain transaction stream. We test those, uh, that ability of management to be able to operate outside the controls. All the testing was performed as planned. It was completed. There was no issues noted. Uh, revenue recognition, again, one we've talked about in the past, uh, that revenue may be incorrectly recorded uh, in terms of whether it's recorded on the income statement as revenue or recorded on the balance sheet as deferred revenue. And so one of the tests we do is to make sure that the revenue is allocated to the correct period when it's being brought into uh, the statement of operations and eventually into net assets. And again, all testing was performed as planned. Uh, there was no issues with the testing that we executed uh, and no errors were noted. Accrued liabilities, uh, just sort of given the nature, and we talked about this one before, given the nature of uh, the sort of construction that the, the organization oversees, we're obviously very uh, concerned with cutoff and making sure we've got the correct accruals from uh, our suppliers at the end of the year. So we do some specific testing around that. Uh, again, uh, all the balances were confirmed. Um, we did have one unadjusted difference in this area. Uh, one of the suppliers had provided the organization uh, an estimate of what their uh, year end accrual should be. And when we got the confirmation back, it was slightly different by about a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Essentially just a timing issue between when the organization has recorded it and what the supplier has now gone and said in their confirmation. So um, it's not a material error. We put it on our unadjusted differences. Management's aware of it. We've discussed it. Um, we're not recommending a journal entry for it. Uh, and so we've moved on from that, that item. Uh, next page. Uh, assets under development. Uh, we performed specific testing around that. Obviously, it's the most significant asset on the balance sheet. And again, that's part of the, you know, the capitalization and, and the deferral of revenue, all that sort of flows together. So we do all that testing as one um, to substantiate that the cap, the assets under development is the correct balance on the balance sheet. Uh, construction deposits, uh, anytime there's a deposit made, we're ensuring that it's recorded as a deposit and it shouldn't be recorded as an expense um, based on the timing uh, of what that deposit relates to. The contribution agreements, we, re we review all the contribution agreements. Um, any new contribution during the year is reviewed and documented uh, in our file, and then deferral of contributions and grants. Again, that goes sort of hand in hand with the revenue recognition. Uh, COVID-19, we've assessed management's assessment of the COVID-19 impact, and there's been no issues noted. And then climate disclosures, uh, as Lisa talked about, there was some work done around that this year. Uh, and again, because there was some information put into the financial statements, we sort of reviewed that and audited around that to make sure that uh, we have sort of agreed with management's assessment, and we did. Uh, moving on. Internal control matters, talked about this in the past as well, so we're not doing a, a, a formal control audit, but we do obviously test a number of controls, specifically around the financial transaction streams, and we've 
you know, our testing was completed as planned. The controls we expected to be in place were in place and the controls were all working effectively. Uh, so there's no control deficiencies noted and no areas uh, that I need to discuss with you at this point. So there is our unadjusted difference. So uh, Clearway Construction was the vendor that I mentioned. They had they had provided Simpata a specific balance. Um, we saw that in an email uh, when their confirmation finally came back. It had a different balance on it, so we were required to go with the number on the confirmation. Um, given that it was a not material amount, their confirmation did come back a little bit late. Um, Lisa and I made the decision not to investigate further, and we've left it on the unadjusted differences schedule. We move on to the next page. Other required communication. These are just some things that CPA Canada requires uh, the auditors to disclose to the committee. Uh, I won't go through those in detail, but essentially there were no issues or no matters to report as a result of these these items. We continue on. Uh, so I mean, I won't, we won't go through these in detail. You've, you've seen the draft independent auditors report in the financial statements um, and the representation letter is the letter that we asked management to sign at the end of the audit. Um, I've included it in case the committee is uh, interested in anything that uh, we've asked them to represent to us in there. And it also will have the unadjusted difference schedule attached to it that management will sign and approve. Overall audit went efficiently, uh, went clean, went smooth. Um, that one unadjusted, unadjusted difference seems to just be a, a, a random rare issue where something sort of um, didn't come back as we expected, um, even though we'd asked for the information ahead of time. Um, but no, overall, uh, the audit went very well. So happy to take any questions from the committee at this point. Jeff, I would uh, don't mean to speak for the whole committee, but I'm comfortable leaving the materiality threshold where it is below the 3% given the tri-party government. And uh, we can review it again at this time next year based on spending, but I think let's err on the side of caution and keep it at that level unless anybody strongly disagrees on the committee. Great. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't recommending to increase. It. I just wanted the committee to be aware of the, of the option. But I do think that from an efficiency standpoint and the quality of the audit that the, the committee receives, increasing the materiality isn't going to going to change that at all. Okay. Well, that's great. Any other questions for a PDO? Jeff? OK, um, thanks for your work on that. Um, Thank you very much, everyone. At this point, with a clean audit opinion, um, I'm going to ask for a motion to approve the financial statements for the last fiscal year. Recommending approval. <laughs> recommending approval. Recommending so approval to the board. Yeah. So, yes, second. Drew, second. Um, I'll second it. Okay. Carried. Okay, I think we now are on to the internal audit plan refresh, which we have to approve, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's um, MNP. Yeah, Veronica, maybe I can just provide um, <coughs> introductory comments. One sure. is um, on this item. So this is our internal water plan refresh. Um, really, since it's been over two years um, since the Farm Committee approved our internal water plan, we wanted to um, review, refresh it against current risks and opportunities. So we've proposed some amendments, um, which Veronica Vila from MNP will review um, shortly. Um, I do note that there is a site incremental fee increase because we are proposing to add one more audit related to um, accessibility or AOTA and extend the plan by one year. And the fees are outlined in the closed session under item 13B. And both the updated plan and the associated fees presented to the Farm Committee are for approval and recommended for approval by management. Okay. To you, Veronica. Okay, great. And welcome back. Yeah, thanks very much. It's very nice to see everybody again. Um, Scott Crowley um, was going to join. He's on his way flying from Montreal, so I, I guess he, I, I messaged him, but I think he's probably flying. I haven't heard from him, um, but I'll be OK. I can I can present. Um, so thanks um, for I see the presentation up. So if you can just go to the overview. Um, just wanted to highlight or show um, how we did the refresh. So if, if you recall uh, in February 2020, um, three year uh, risk based internal audit plan was approved. It, it included six uh, internal audits. So as of uh, February, um, just as February 2022, two of the audits had been completed. 
um, with the most recently the resource and succession planning review. And then because of it being two years, I uh, thought that it would be an opportune time to to recalibrate and and refresh um, the internal audit plan and review that uh, just given things that have changed over two years, the risk appetite of the organization changes in risk landscape, ongoing um, organizational initiatives and in that. So um, we did that review. Um, and uh, as Lisa mentioned, the audit refresh was taken and uh, we are proposing some changes to the audit plan um, within uh, for this for the term for one additional year and the scope as well. OK, next uh, next slide. So this just um, provides the next couple of slides provide just the approach that we took. So so to do this refresh, we uh, reviewed the existing um, enterprise uh, risk register to understand uh, the current risk landscape um, and then also facilitated some discussions on the existing emerging risks that the organization will be is facing as, and is anticipated to face. Um, we also did some key documentation review looking at um, um, leading uh, risk literature that's out there and um, other strategic documentation of waterfront. Um, and then from that, looking at the risk register ratings, we then um, applied an internal audit risk rating and uh, we applied some different criteria, which um, is on the next uh, slide. And then from that is where we just determined um, what uh, audits we would like to put into the audit universe and into the audit plan. So the next slide shows uh, this audit criteria. So when we are looking at uh, doing the risk rating for internal audit, we look at uh, your 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 existing risk residual risk and, and risk ratings for the organization, um, the history of issues um, in an area, um, if there's any major change or or something anticipated um, in that in that space. Uh, like as I mentioned, leading internal audit literature, just because there are risk uh, inherently risky areas. Um, we look at last time an audit uh, was done. Uh, we look at it, what uh, other um, organizations and entities and government might be auditing um, you as well. Uh, and then looking for um, if there's any uh, opportunities for improving productivity or other um, organizational objectives. So from that, we, we determine our risk rating. So I think the next slide shows um, how we kind of put this all together. So we, we uh, lie out the audit name, which is like the audit uh, university universe or the audit uh, area, uh, what the existing um, ERM risk rating is and link it to the risk register. And then you can see our internal audit risk rating and how that corresponds to to the uh, various um, audits. So from from looking at this, we have uh, selected um, and proposed for the audit plan the items um, the audits that are highlighted in blue there um, and you can see that they all have a high to medium high um, risk rating and we really wanted to recalibrate and refresh the internal audit plan to to focus on um, these high uh, higher risk areas of the organization the uh, the next slide yeah so in the next two slides show um, what the refresh internal audit plan uh, will be. Um, so uh, we've done the first year, first year, which is this fiscal 2022-2023, is really having um, three audits, but they are all very interrelated and geared and focused on the ERP system. Um, so the first one we'd like to, to do is look at uh, completing a ERP system implementation lessons learned um, Assign, uh, assessment. So that's looking at uh, what can be learned to inform future projects, what are what were implementation gaps, root causes for delays, um, and then what uh, improvements could be made. Um, after that, we'd like to focus then on uh, the procurement process specifically within the ERP. So looking at the approval workflows and thresholds to identify if we can um, improve efficiencies and, and provide um, opportunities for other improvements in that procurement process. And then once that's completed, we'd like to look um, if there are any opportunities within the ERP system to do robotic process automation. Um, this is a leading practice emerging area. Um, and if we're able to leverage anything that the ERP system can do and, and improve efficiencies within um, uh, Waterfront Toronto, we'd like to to look at that and make those uh, those improvement opportunities. 
Um, and then this is the additional year that we're adding um, 2023 to 2024. Um, we'd like to look at cybersecurity. Um, again, it by this time it would be about five years or so since we did a full um, cybersecurity audit. So as you know, this space is evolving and um, changing so so frequently and so fast that um, and it is inherently um, high risk and, and risky. So we do want to do another full internal uh, cybersecurity um, audit in this area. And then um, one additional audit that we're adding to this year into the plan is um, on accessibility. And um, this this stems from a overall compliance deadline. Um, that the province has to ensure that um, the AODA Act is uh, the Accessibility Act is fully um, implemented by um, all organizations within the um, within the province, and so we want to, uh, we we pick the timing of this to ensure that uh, we do this compliance assessment and uh, provide management with um, any non-compliance areas and recommendations for improvement, and so they have time to then. Um, implement those and remediate those so that they're compliant um, by that January 1st, 2025 deadline. And then the appendix just shows um, a summary of the evolution of the original three year plan and how it's. Um, what's been completed from it and what's been um, and evolved and changed and proposed uh, uh, over time. So happy to uh, answer any any questions on that. Thanks for that report, Veronica. Uh, assuming there's no questions, management highlighted that they are on side with this and the extension yes. of the mandate for a year. So can I get a motion to approve the internal audit uh, refresh? Sorry, can I just ask okay. a question? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, Veronica, I'm just wondering why we're not focusing on records and information management or project management process controls over something like accessibility. I know we've been kind of delaying those and I know that there's still issues with the ERP system, but I understand the ERPs, you know, 90, 95% implemented. Those seem to be a bit more important than accessibility or robotic process automation. Just because we've got so much exposure with our big Portland's project and some other big uh, projects as well. Jeannie, I, I can answer with respect to records and information management that was on the uh, in the plan previously mm -hmm. and was intended to be part of the plan and completed. I think the Auditor General highlighted that too, right? Yeah, yeah. And so we have um, an enterprise content management project, which is all about um, creating a new information architecture for how we store our, our files, how we, um, as a data governance piece to it in terms of um, determining which records are confidential, which have privacy, private privacy. So that, that project, because of the pandemic and other priorities, um, it's still on, still planned. However, it's shifted to start implementation this year, and because it's starting implementation this year, it won't be completed in time to be audited in this round. Okay. So it is up in the audit pool, and it would be one of the next audits um, to be added, you know, in the next round of, of, of audit updates. Yeah, and and if I may add, um, when we do look at the cybersecurity, there is um, controls around data classification. Um, and, and the privacy of of information. Um, there's there's you know a section on that. So uh, while we touch on it during there, um, we can have we could uh, find um, opportunities for improvement um, with that, and that could inform the 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 implementation and and that of the the system that Lisa was mentioning. And what about the project management process the, control? The federal so. government will be doing a uh, an audit on the Pro Portland's flood protection project this year. Okay, so we'll they cover that. Audit. Okay. All right. yeah. and, that, and some of those areas are also covered by the ERP lessons learned audit, yeah. the procurement processes and um, robotic process automation is all about also, you know, how entering invoices instead of manually like yeah. using OCR okay. and things like that. So, okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Glad. Anything else? Drew's got See, Drew has, yeah, Drew has a question. Yeah, hi. hi. Um, I, I think you mentioned this, Veronica, off the top, and that is the context of kind of all the players who audit this organization um, being tripartite in terms of government. What's the process then? A little bit more detail with regard to how you prioritize, how you work with management. I think there was just a reference with regard to one audit that the feds are going um, to ensure that you're focused on things to best effect that are not, it's not 
repeated from other organizations. Yeah, yeah, Drew, you're right. So so we work with um, Lisa to understand where uh, other organizations are coming into audit. Um, Waterfront Toronto and and really to lessen audit fatigue mm -hmm. and you mentioned duplication. We we don't want to uh, audit in the same areas because that uh, that wouldn't provide value from internal audit uh, for looking at the same spots all the time. So so we do focus um, our time on other areas that uh, that uh, the other government government entities were not uh, focusing on. I see George has his hand up. I just wanted to ask about AODA and the fact that that hasn't been audited before. Right. Um, this is going to be, I think, a political sensitivity yeah. coming up against 2025. George, we both have yeah. the bruises from some of those things. So good that it's being done, but I am intrigued and I have wondered with regard to work yeah. ongoing because everybody's challenged by it. George? Yeah, yeah Drew, uh, and that's why I actually had my hand up. Uh, we wanted to identify issues because we have to be compliant in what, 2025? Yeah. Um, and the reason I moved the audit up, there's no sense finding out that we're not compliant. I want to actually find out what our gaps are and make sure we're compliant by that deadline. And that's why we've moved that audit up. So that, that, that's what my hand was up for, so I can take it down. <laughs> Thanks, George. Drew, uh, anything further? And I will ask for that motion to approve the, the update, the refresh. Jeannie, seconded. It. All in favor? I think that is carried. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to some approvals we have to do on uh, pro capital projects. So that's back to you, David. Uh, actually, I'm going to hand it over to Pina for the uh, okay. Parliament slip. Oh, it does say Pina in there, sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Charmaine, if you can go to page 128. As you may recall, in June of 2021, management obtained approval from the Board of Directors to add Parliament slip activation uh, to the rolling five-year strategic plan and proceed with advancing the design of the project. At that time, the motion included a statement that you see as, the, as C on the slide right here, uh, that spending should not exceed $2.86 million, which was defined as the value required to reach the 30% design milestone until such time that project funding has been secured. Um, so that's the motion uh, that we approved in 2021. We're looking for an amendment to this, but before we get into the details, maybe we can go to um, page 130 and I could just take a minute to orient um, the farm and board committees members to the site and um, the specifics. So um, I'm going to start by the pink dash line that you see on the screen uh, represents the existing outline of Parliament slip. So it's got like a triangular shape with a point on the northeast corner. Um, the triangle to the north labeled as Parliament slip Lakeville North um, is the Lakeville required to extend Queen's Key to the east and realign Parliament Street. Parliament Street goes down on an angle right now. We're, we're going to be straightening that out. Those two realignments uh, create block three of the Keyside site and enable the development of that parcel, which today is largely the existing Parliament Street right away. This is all funded, uh, the Lakeville and the road realignments through the Keyside infrastructure project and is on the critical path for the Keyside project um, because those realignments are required before we can convey block three to the Keyside developer. The rectangle um, outline, which is labeled Parliament Slip South on the plan, is Lakeville required to deliver on uh, Waterfront Toronto's vision for the Parliament Slip activation. It becomes the site of the future swimming pools and public space at the north end of the slip. And the Lakeville portion of this work is funded through WT land revenues. The pools and public space are currently unfunded and we are seeking government funding for that um, activation project. The blue line on the plan, that's the proposed dock well that will hold in all the Lakeville that happens to the north. Uh, Charmaine, if we can go back to page 129. Since uh, the June board meeting, WT staff had, have advanced the design of Parliament slip activation and it has become, um, it's been determined that the most cost effective uh, and time effective approach to delivering the Lakeville is in a continuous manner. Um, so the 
Parliament Slip Lakeville, Lakeville North and South uh, being delivered as one contiguous project. This would result in a more efficient construction process and could save as much as $11 million over doing those two projects separately. As I mentioned, while the funding for the full, full Parliament Slip project, uh, the activation has not been secured, the funding for the Lakeville on the south rectangle is secured from WT land revenues. And as a result, uh, management is seeking approval to remove the $2.86 million uh, spending restriction, uh, C, in the previous motion, and recommending that we proceed with the 60% design for the Lakeville for both of those two portions in an integrated way. The incremental cost to get to 60% design uh, for that is about $600,000 over what would have been spent on doing the Queen's Key portion. And um, the combined project, what I call the Pentagon, uh, will return to farm and the board for uh, capital approval uh, at the 60% design milestone. So we're only looking for the board to let us get to that point in an integrated way. So if we go to slide 131, we will see the motion that we're proposing is to remove that uh, C from the previous board motion that was approved in June of 2021. As I understand it, Tina, the, the 2.86 was basically, let's not get too far out over our skis until we find out the project's fully funded. Correct. We now know we have a viable project, um, even if we don't get further funding and we're committed to this. So this is gonna save construction costs and then allow us to open block three, which we've committed to do already, correct? Correct, okay. exactly. Why are we not just amending the amount and adding 600,000 to it instead of- that's, another, that's actually another way to do it, Jeannie. We just thought to be flexible just in case- it We actually don't have funding for the Parliament slip, right? We, we do for the lake fill. We do yeah, for the lake fill we do, yeah. but yeah. yes. Uh, and I think we, we discussed that, Jeannie, and we didn't want to have to come back again, essentially, is what it boils down to, in case we did. Um, it, it's just, it, it gets us to where we need to get to by removing the restriction as opposed to increasing the cap. Yeah, and understanding that we'll be coming back for capital approval once the 60% is complete. You'll have another kick at this can. Yeah, and, and we'll be reporting back on progress uh, on our quarterly basis, right? So you'll be able to monitor how we're doing. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, um, everyone can see the motion on the board there. Can I get a motion to approve that? Any? Drew, Michael, any comment? Any opposed? Other okay. Hand. Nope. Car carried. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the project continues to look exciting. Can't wait to see it. Um, now we're on to the Broadview Eastern Flood Protection, which we spoke about at length earlier this week. David, can you fill everybody in? We did, um, and the presentation is going to be made by Ken Dion, who's our Director of um, Portland's Integration uh, Projects. However, I'm going to bit of, give a bit of context and background before Ken uh, describes what the project is and what we are looking for. Um, this project is not included in our, uh, currently included in our strategic plan, so we are, we are asking um, the Farm Committee and Board to include the project. And uh, just in terms of background, uh, the Broadview Eastern Flood Protection Environmental Assessment was completed last year, approved by uh, Toronto City Council and the uh, Ministry of Environment. Uh, it was a, an environmental assessment conducted by TRCA uh, with the involvement of Waterfront Toronto and the city. We uh, did not include in our plan any work beyond the environmental assessment um, because this area is really chock-a-block full of a whole bunch of projects. The biggest one uh, being Portland's, the second biggest, maybe it's actually bigger, is the Ontario line um, that uh, Metrolinx is doing. So there was a question as to who was best placed to actually do this project. Would it be uh, Metrolinx, uh, would it be the City of Toronto, would it be TRC or, or Waterfront Toronto? After quite a bit of deliberation discussion, it was determined that Waterfront Toronto should kick the project off um, and begin to do the design work, which is what um, we're going to be looking for capital approval for. Um, there may be pieces of this um, implementation that will get done by Metrolinx because it makes more sense for them to do it, um, but for the moment um, it looks like we're the 
um, best, uh, best place. We have the resources available. We have the expertise um, to uh, begin this delivery. And um, this work is funded. Uh, the work we will be doing is funded fully by the city. Um, the full funding for the Broadview Eastern um, is still under negotiation and there may be contributions from other parties, um, but ultimately it will be the um, it will be the city um, taking the lead in implementing and they're looking to us to uh, uh, to be their implementation um, agent, um, not to use that term um, legally, um, just as they did for next year, um, uh, the Lakeshore Boulevard project. So um, with that, I'll turn over to Ken who can describe um, very quickly what the work is that we're looking to get approved um, and uh, and why. And essentially we're it's it's because the uh, um, the work exceeds uh, five million for us to get the design started. So we need the uh, uh, farm committee and board to um, uh, grant approval to uh, begin that work. So Ken, can you? Uh... Yes, thank you very much, David, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'll quickly run through this presentation to give some of the details that uh, David alluded to. Uh, the scope of the phase one implementation is looking to take detailed design for the flood protection that was identified in the class EA uh, last year up to a 60% level of design. Uh, it's currently at a 30% level from the EA from a grading perspective. However, the, the big gap that we have right now is uh, upgrading the amount of information we have from the soils and, and uh, subsurface conditions, as well as advancing designs for a big spaghetti a mess of infrastructure that underlies the entire area that needs to be incorporated so that we can uh, integrate that uh, existing infrastructure into the overall flood protection solution. So there's a series of uh, consultants we need to hire, including a, a lead design team, as well as a, a series of um, cost control and project control consultants to help us make sure that uh, we're moving forward in the best appropriate way as we uh, not only work with this project, but with multiple other prod major capital projects that are underway in the exact same area, uh, in the exact same time with regard regards to railway expansions, new train stations, development plans, and other um, major municipal infrastructure such as the Coxwell bypass in the area. So it is a very uh, complex project like PLFP, but in a much smaller confined area. Next slide. What is the context? The image on the right you see here was generally what the flood remaining residual flood in that would occur following implementation of the uh, Don Mouth Naturalization, the PLFP project, uh, on the basis that um, everything was implemented, including what was identified as the grading solution, Eastern Avenue underpass. Uh, you will note there is no spill occurring with what's become the Broadview Avenue extension. That is a city project that was initiated following the submission of the Don Mouth EA back in 2000. 14. Um, and so what this was initially done is to try to provide and eliminate this flooding north of the railway embankment uh, to facilitate that Broadview Avenue expansion. It, it also would eliminate the need for the, the Eastern Avenue grading, which has been put on hold during PLFP as a result of anticipation of this project moving forward. And it's become even more complicated with the relocation of uh, what was the TTC subway, uh, subway that was supposed to be going through underground in this area to uh, now become the Ontario line on the railway embankment and the new train station. So there's a whole level of extra coordination uh, that ha is required to be done uh, in order to facilitate that work to be opened uh, as a result to the comprehensive flood protection that this would provide. Next slide, please. To give you a bit of context of what's in the area, uh, most of the site, as you can see, is private ownership and commercial car dealerships. Uh, you have the uh, Metrolinx Lakeshore existing condition subdivision on the south end. You have the Eastern Avenue Pass uh, uh, underpass over in the east. Eastern Avenue, existing Eastern Avenue bounds it in the north. We also have uh, the on-ramp to the DVP and the Coxwell project site, which is currently and still in occupation by the City of Toronto as part of their infrastructure expansion works that we have to coordinate into the overall phasing schedule. You also note two old bridges on the Don River. Both have to come out 
as part of the overall flood protection solution. One is owned by Enbridge that was actually supposed to come out this year. They've had some delays with Bell. That's, so there is a, a new schedule coming up uh, with their work. Uh, we've also identified that the old Eastern Avenue bridge owned by the city has to come out. Uh, Waterfront Toronto has already developed a 30% decommissioning design for that. And this scope has been rolled into the overall Broadview Eastern flood protection work for implementation and has been included in the, uh, the long term costs for this as well. Next slide. The the EA itself um, identified several key components, very discreet, and each has its own uh, challenges. Uh, the first scope of work uh, is one which involves the large spaghetti amount of infrastructure that underlies the Sunlight Avenue, uh, Sunlight Park Road uh, area, which basically bisects the, the flood protection area that needs to be um, uh, advanced to remove, re reinforce, or, or uh, relocate the utilities and servicing within that area, as well as deal with the three unused oil pipelines that are located on the east side of the DVP between Sunlight and Eastern Avenue. Uh, we're hopeful through the design process that we uh, don't actually have to touch them. We're hoping to refine the footprint of the flood protection, but until such time that we can confirm that we have to presume that we do have to deal with those old pipes to deal decommission and relocation. So that work is required to do. We also, number two is the uh, overlap in, in space and potentially time, which we have to work with in the overall grand scheme of things of the projects, uh, creating the new flood protection landform and tie off into the after uh, the railway embankment. Um, and so we have to work with the design and implementation process with regards to uh, the Ontario line expansion. Number three deals with creating a landform in the north uh, on pr publicly owned lands. And then of course we have to deal with a grading solution that ties the two uh, landforms uh, on privately owned properties involving uh, access agreements and coordination with the various projects on the um, BMW sites in the location. And of course remove the the, the railway bridge. Next slide. Uh, as David said, this is not part of the five year strategic plan. Next slide. Uh, there's three scopes of work broadly. Uh, we need a pre design work that's uh, going forward as an amendment from the original delivery agreement from the EA to collect some underground information on infrastructure and soils. We're hoping to have that uh, amendment done in the next uh, week or so uh, so that we can move forward with the investigation work. The phase one 60% design would be a new delivery agreement directly with the City of Toronto that would uh, advance uh, the scope previously identified. And then the phase two final design and implementation, which would be funded by various parties probably uh, going from 2023 to 2027 would be uh, confirmed through a separate delivery agreement or an amendment to this one that we're looking to do now. Next slide. There's a series of risks originally identified with this. A lot of it has to deal with the fact that we have um, a lot of uh, players uh, and skin in the game within a very tight time frame, type geography. So there's a lot of coordination, differences in agency approvals, multiple levels of authorizations and coordination that needs to be done and managed uh, effectively through an overall program management process. Uh, we, the other risks, of course, is when the original budget was done on the basis of a pre-COVID world, so there's been a lot of escalation in the price of properties. It was also a bit on the basis of a single project moving forward in the area and not the cumulative impacts on private properties as a result of all the other confounding projects within the area. So there's there's a lot of significant risks that has to be worked out over the next 60, uh, next year or so on the 60% design process. Next next slide, next slide. Next slide again. So we're looking forward to moving forward with the uh, the uh, subsurface investigations to the uh, amendment of the existing de uh, delivery agreement. We're looking forward to advancing forward with the phase one design work. And right now we're doing a lot of um, scope of works on the RFPs that are being prepared, scopes of works of the amendments and, uh, and, and uh, filling out the details for the new delivery agreement. Next slide. This gives you a flavor of the various uh, in, uh disciplines that are required for the various components, uh, the pre-design and the phase one works. Next slide. 
And so we uh, this is the justification why we are at Farm Committee today. It's not part of the uh, the uh, five year rolling strategic plan and it exceeds the five million dollar capital uh, expenditure uh, requirements. Next slide. This gives an idea of the value of the cost for the pre design work, which will bring it up to uh, the, which the existing delivery agreement is at 1.8 million. This will essentially double the value of it, but that will remain below the five million dollar limits of, uh, to do the subsurface investigation. Next slide. And these two slides outline the initial cost for the 60% design for soft cost of TRCA, Waterfront Toronto, and some of our expected expenses that have to come. Uh, next slide as well as the consultant costs, uh, which are at about $3.5 million, bringing the initial 60% design cost to 5.7 million. Next slide. And that just provides a summary of it. Next slide. So these are the recommendations seeking to proceed uh, direction to go to uh, the board next month uh, to authorize the 7.5 million required between the pre-design and phase one, as well as uh, recommending that this be added to the five-year rolling strategic plan and that we'll come back to the committee and board when we have a, a confirmed new budget for the uh, phase two works of uh, finalizing design and implementation schedule. Thank you very much. Questions, Jeannie? So David, basically this is just a uh, project management fee kind of uh, work for Waterfront Toronto. So it looks like we're going to make 1.156 million in project management fees and it's fully funded. So really they're just using our expertise. That's right. It's fully funded and our costs will be reimbursed. And will we be having to, what's the timing of the cash flow? Are we going to have to bankroll any of this or will the funding come in? Like, are we, you know? No, we shouldn't okay. have to bankroll it. Okay. Because I know it's fully funded, but there's a difference between them promising versus when the cash hits our bank accounts. So, yeah. Okay, so we shouldn't have to cash flow any of it. Hopefully. Okay, yeah. and we'll make the fees. And we have capacity and we do. all of that. So. Okay. And the, and the question I had earlier just um, was that this is as a result of the Ontario line. So why does this not fall on the Metro links? Um, it there's been extensive negotiations between the city and Metrolinx um, and um, we've been part of that. TRC has been part of that. It was ultimately it was Metrolinx determined that they wanted to stick with their um, focus and expertise, which is transit and leave the um, flood protection and, 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 and the rest of the work associated with this to others. And we're the others essentially is what it is. We still right. know it'll get done properly yeah. and on time and on budget. <laughs> No pressure, David. <laughs> Drew, Michael, any other questions on this item? Leslie's question. I, I oh. have a, a, just a, but I'll wait till the committee's finished and then I'll. Oh, go ahead, Leslie. Yeah, so just a quick question so I understand. Um, uh, the subsequent work that isn't funded, so first of all, this isn't in our plan, but but we're getting compensated to do the work. Um, I'm trying for the subsequent um, beyond the 60% to move to const to construction. I'm just trying to reconcile the Metrolinx Cadillac Fairview schedule with our schedule. And in the last public meeting, Cadillac Fairview said they wanted to start construction in 2023. And, and I know that the Bay, the Broadview extension is a critical par, part of their redevelopment in terms of access. Is that going to is that going to put pressure upon our involvement? to accelerate the work or is that is that one of the kind of points that's trying to be reconciled? I'm just trying to understand <clears throat> uh, not so much what's in front of us, but what's going to come after this in terms of asks to the committee or to the board. Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Thank you for that question. Uh, the city sees our project, the flood protection project, basically part and parcel of the East Harbor Station, the Ontario line, the Broadview extension, and by an extension, the work that Cadillac Ferby is doing south of the railway embankment. So there really is a requirement for us to work collaboratively between the projects and there's, there is committees set up so that we can actually meet on a regular, very regular basis between all the projects to ensure that we have a comprehensive schedule and programming put, uh, put in place so that we can 
not only meet the schedules of the critical aspects, ensuring that flood protection is established for Cadillac, is for Broadview, the East Harbor Station, uh, but also to help us um, avoid stepping on each other's toes, creating over uh, throwaway costs, unnecessary throwaway costs. We're trying to find the most ex uh, expeditious way to deal with uh, areas of overlap. There is already huge pressures, as you note, for us to be able to deliver the flood protection by 2027 in July, as a result exactly for those needs to uh, get the early buildings uh, available for occupancy, to get the station available for occupancy and operations as well. So um, yeah, it is, it is going to be a very busy, it's going to be very complicated and, um, and, and a high level of integration between the various uh, project elements. I, I think, I, and I think Leslie, sorry, just sorry. What? can I can I just speak one one other thing beyond that um, that's pertinent sure. is that the um, the way this is being is likely to proceed is that the work that on um, Metrolinx and Cadillac Fairview do will actually affect the flood protection um, as part of the Portland's flood protection project because they will be removing the main um, hydraulic barrier, which is the railway embankment to do their construction. That will not really start until after our Portland's project is completed. So, you know, the, the flood protection imparted by the Portland's project um, will, will be affected by that work, which means we, you know, and the city and Metrolinx and Cadillac would like, uh, we'd all like to get the Broadview Eastern done as quickly as we possibly can, and, and that's what we'll be aiming to do. Um, however, there are still negotiations required and and funding required to actually implement that project. Yeah, and, and I just my last comment. I was just trying. I want to make sure that uh, corporation guards against. We have a lot of uh, projects underway, and um, the, the the schedule of the Ontario line and the Cadillac Fairview uh, proposal has its own schedule, and I just want to make sure if it if it places pressure on our organization that we actually are compensated to find the resource to meet their schedule so that it's all well coordinated and that we're not having to make choices about other related uh, work that we're doing that that's what i'm trying to understand that's the, thank Understood. you very much uh and if i could very quickly respond to that we we are um already in the process of assessing um reallocation of resources from the portlands as that work is uh being completed um, our resources are becoming available for other projects. This is one of them that we're looking at. Um, we've obviously got Keyside, um, potentially transit, um, and uh, and ultimately Villiers Island that we're looking at how the you know how those projects could be resourced in the future as you know as funding is made available and those projects move forward. Thank you very, thank you very much. Okay, moving along. Can I get a motion? Drew's got a question. Oh, Drew, sorry, I didn't see you, Drew. Go ahead. Just a, just a contextual question, uh, everybody. Um, so I can remember going back a dozen years when we were doing the flood protection zone on the on the west side um, for the Pan Am lands and everything. Um, and this was always in the planning um, for further down the road. I don't know if it slipped in any way, not just in the planning because given timing and things like that. What I'm intrigued by is just to compare the work that will ultimately be done on this side of the river, on the east side of the river versus the west side of the river in terms of, I remember terminology about a hundred year flood and, and things like that. And the degree to which that might have changed, and maybe it's an unfair question because of the Ontario line and the uh, development, um, some of which Leslie just reference. I'm just interested in a comparison between East and West, if I could. Uh, thank you, Drew, for that. Uh, I was involved with the West on lands as well for uh, when I was at TRCA. So um, the big difference, of course, is that two thirds of the site on the east side of the river is in private ownership. Um, right. On the west side, uh, it was entirely owned by I, uh, ORC at the time, the province. So we, we had uh, a much cleaner slate to work with. There was essentially no operations other than a few big billboards and uh, infrastructure and contaminated soil that we had to deal with to do the flood protection there. So it was a lot easier on the coordination side to be able to advance that. Um, even, However, even with that, as you know, with the Pan Am Games and before that, there was the Olympic bid pressures and then there was different um, development pressures. So even with a sort of clean slate on the west side of the river, there was the changing 
priorities of what parts of the flood protection should be implemented first to accommodate various needs that uh, for the, the lands that would be unlocked. Here it's going to be much more, um, a ch it will be a challenge to deal with the fact that, you know, we're all, you know, four major, five major projects in the very small area, all requiring the same staging spaces on privately owned lands. Uh, there's a major juggling of, of logistics and administration uh, to ensure that one project doesn't sort of, you know, the, the big guy in the room doesn't push all the other projects aside so that they can do what they want to make it more difficult. So there, there needs to be really strong, um, led through the tr transit expansion office, strong uh, program governance uh, approach to make sure that uh, all the projects have the, 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 the ability to coordinate and, 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 and plan and schedule and implement uh, that benefits all of the projects at the same and, time. Rather. And beyond that, we right. don't currently have a landowner that's 100% on board with what's happening. Exactly. So we, we there are negotiations that have to happen with the with the existing landowner because all of this work is happening on their land. So um, that's uh, that's another issue, another part of what we're dealing with. So. Yeah, and MetroLynx has been identified as the agency to lead the negotiations comprehensively for all the projects in the area. Currently. So we're, we're actually about in the process as we speak to have a city committee or a staff join Metrolinx in that to ensure that all the projects are equally represented in the negotiations appropriately, but uh, that that's work that's currently underway. Okay, thanks. Okay, that's a good fulsome discussion. I'm going to move us forward. The uh, We'll be hearing lots more about this, including the, the funding agreement, um, but can we get the motion to recommend this to the board? Jeannie? I'm happy to move it. Second. All in favor? Okay, carried. Um, next thing on my agenda is the port, the Portlands, and the report of BTY. Um, so yeah, so I'll do a quick update on where we, um, um, I guess where we were at the end of March. Uh, then I'll do an update on the um, uh, budget and schedule, and then BTY um, will provide their commentary. So in terms of the update, uh, as Rocky um, indicates here, the excavation for the entire river, uh, excluding the east or the north and west plugs, um, is now complete. Um, we are in the process of, uh, in the next couple of weeks, completing the risk management measures, which are actually more or less under the um, Commissioner Street Bridge, which was the last area to be excavated. Um, once that's done, then finishes, uh, final finishes will commence um, everywhere in the river, although they've already started, as you'll see as the photos move forward. Um, we're also, um, we've now just completed, according to Rocky this morning, the excavation in Canoe Cove. Rocky is giving us a lot of good information. Um, and the sediment debris management area, um, where uh, really good progress was being made, um, work has, had, has stopped for the last couple of weeks uh, as a result of the strikes. I'll have more to report on that um, shortly. Where's the area that we were just talking about on that map? Is it? <coughs> it's not on that map, actually. Okay, it's, it's just over. It's just, yeah, it's just to the right and north of the east and north of the sediment dream management okay. area, which is the top, um, on the other side of the Dodd River. Okay. Uh, next. Um, just uh, our latest uh, drone uh, flyover. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details um, of this. Uh, you've got it. You can have a look at it in your uh, package. Next. Um, further detail from the drone, you can see the Cherry Street South Bridge is in place uh, and the um, Canoe Cove uh, outline is shown here. Um, and that's the south half of the uh, Promontory Park um, at that location. Next. Uh, so update, here's the uh, Canoe Cove excavation um, and that will be uh, open to the river um, when we're all complete. Um, Next. How deep is that? That is not very, uh, and the river itself is not very deep. It's it's a it's a couple of meters. It's deep enough to kayak and canoe, okay. and it's actually it's sort of intended for for kids yeah. cool. um, to keep them out of the river flow. Um, we see the bit more information. Canoe Cove. We've actually started placing uh, armor stone and riprap, which are, will be the final finishes for portions of that. Um, so that work is happening next. Um, in the River Valley uh, wetland uh, finishes uh, in the uh, in the wetlands as well as uh, river finishes are underway. You can see the uh, um, dead trees and drowned trees. Um, dead trees isn't my favorite name, but they are so. 
Next, uh, here we have the excavation uh, you can see was uh, uh, underway under the uh, Commissioner Street bridges, which were placed uh, before the excavation of the river commenced in that area. Next. Um, sediment debris management area, as I said, a lot of work um, uh, was underway um, and that actually work will uh, recommence very shortly. Um, I'll provide an update on that moment in a, in a few minutes. Next. Um, in the uh, uh, Lakeshore uh, East and Bridge, um, the eastbound bridge has been uh, removed. As you can see here, work is underway to repair the center abutment, uh, as well as beginning the caissons and uh, uh, sheet piling to the east, or sorry, to the west of the bridge uh, to allow us to uh, begin to excavate the, um, uh, the balance of the uh, river under Lakeshore. Next, um, won't get into the details in terms of what uh, everything's going on, but there is there is work happening across the site. Um, it's a good three hour effort to uh, go and view it all. Um, again, without I'll, I'll just talk here about the uh, um, uh, procurement. You see about 92% uh, awarded as of March. That has increased since then. 95% um, uh, overall in progress and 5% uh, um, which we expect will be fully um, uh, procured by uh, by this fall. Next quarter, you can see uh, um, only slight changes here, but um, uh, on our way to uh, completing the procurement of all of the construction work um, this year. Uh, with respect to complaints tracking uh, in the in the quarter. January to March, we had a total of nine, uh, received a total of nine complaints from the public. Uh, most of those had to do with the congestion surrounding um, uh, the Jarvis Street on ramp to the Gardner. Um, due to the removal of the ramps from uh, Lakeshore Boulevard to the Gardner uh, last September. Next. Uh, with respect to Indigenous communities, we continue to work um, with Mississaugas of the credit. Um, they have been able now to begin coming back out to site, monitoring some of the excavation. Um, we are working to um, procure some um, uh, Indigenous uh, craftspeople and artists um, in collaboration with uh, our um, Minokamic, our, our Minokamic, excuse me, um, our Indigenous uh, design consultant. And in terms of uh, communication public engagement, there's the photo of the uh, arrival of Cherry Street South Bridge on the left and um, on the right, we are hoping that uh, we will be able to um, have a uh, some sort of celebration um, for the opening of the Cherry Street South Bridge and Cherry Street um, extension uh, sometime um, in uh, late summer. Although uh, with you know elections, um, those um, the ability to do those things is somewhat uh, limited. When, Next. Will, when will water actually flow under that bridge? Water will not flow under that bridge until the, around the end of 2023 and it won't be flowing. So what will happen is that we will open up the west plug first um, and that will allow water to begin to come into the river valley from the inner harbor. We don't want any water flowing um, to begin with. So that will be the first thing we do. And in fact, we will flood the river before we open up the plug so that they'll essentially they, they'll be equal on on both sides. Oh, okay. um, yeah. we, we don't we don't want the you know, Gibraltar and the um, sort of massive influx of water creating the Mediterranean Sea kind of happening here. That's not in our best interest. Um, the, the when water is flowing fully, is that the end of the project? Not 100%, no, okay. uh, it isn't. So water will be flowing in summer of 2024, and that's when we'll complete the um, uh, west or the north plug removal. Right. Um, there there will be some um, park and river finishes left to do because we are uh, constrained to a degree by planting windows. There's only certain times in the year that we can plant. So, um, so while we will be completing in most of the work in the summer, um, final plantings can't happen until the fall. Okay, thank you. And I think we're moving on to the next more detailed discussion on um, our latest, uh, our March 31st update on 
um, schedule and um, budget. Are so hearing from BTY first? Uh, no, no, actually BTY first. will comment after we do this. Okay. So now we've set this up. So if we could move to page uh, 175. We are, um, uh, we and we see this, um, this is part of our uh, management uh, and controls process. Um, we have worked through um, 30, 60, 90 percent updates and are on doing semi-annual. So this is our third uh, update um, on e the EAC and um, the schedule. Uh, the uh, just in terms of uh, actually I won't get into the uh, how we got to today because there's a, a better slide for that coming up shortly. Uh, but we've been working on this essentially since uh, February, um, starting with a uh, rescheduling. Um, in an establishment of a new baseline that we've been working with the contractor, or worked with the contractor uh, and BTY um, together on. Um, and that was the um, first phase of our being able to um, uh, assess the um, risk quantification and the EAC. Next slide. Um, we won't get into a whole lot of detail on status. Uh, Earthworks Marina Parks, there's a little bit of uh, design work yet to be done. There are also uh, some tenders outstanding. So the parks tenders um, have closed and are um, uh, close to award. There are uh, in the next week, um, we will be closing the tenders for the um, uh, north and west plugs. Those are the major tenders that remain outstanding. Um, there may be a few small things once those two are done. Uh, next, with respect to bridges, um, we've essentially just some final minor finishes work uh, to be procured. Otherwise, um, we're 100% procured and um, close to being 100% complete with the arrival of the Cherry Street North Bridge um, in the next uh, within the next two months. Um, expected actually at the end of June. Uh, next, roads and services. Um, still some uh, procurement left to do on uh, road finishes, uh, but uh, the majority of the uh, roads and services work is has been procured and is in fact underway on site um, with our first road opening anticipated for August, which is Cherry uh, new commissioners between Old Cherry and New Cherry and New Cherry south to Polson. Next. So in terms of, uh, I, I mentioned we've been working since um, February, so uh, Elliston um, identified uh, really what drove the uh, revised schedule was uh, the realization of risks related to um, utility um, design approval and installations. Um, so Elliston um, uh, reflecting those uh, um, those uh, issues in the schedule, uh, updated the schedule um, and that uh, it was uh, finalized in April. Um, during the uh, March uh, and early April period, we also undertook a, an updated um, risk assessment um, and um, then uh, turned the information over to HDR, uh, the scheduled risk assessment and the uh, revised estimate um, and uh, developed uh, by mid-April um, this, um, this report. Next. So um, where are we today? I did. Um, so what we see here is the uh, results of the uh, EAC uh, estimated completion uh, process as of uh, Q1 2022, and it is shown here in red. Um, the uh, overall uh, costs, hard costs have gone up by just over 20 million, um, though the um, uh, essential or the, the main reasons for that increase are, are twofold. Uh, one is that the schedule um, for um, completion of the uh, River Valley has extended into um, um, mid 2024. Um, while we're always uh, and continue to reflect that we'll be uh, complete in 2024, that um, that extension results in additional costs to um, the contractor uh, for general conditions as well as the um, a consulting team for contract administration. So that's about um, more or less 50% of those additional costs. Um, and then the other portion is a risk that was uh, uh, realized 
uh, related to dewatering and the cost of uh, water treatment essentially for the roads work. And that is, you'll see, I think we reflected later, is about uh, an $8 million uh, cost increase. Um, what that uh, results in is that the um, forecast contingency um, reduces from 29.9 million um, reported at the end of uh, 2021 to a forecast contingency of 5.7 million um, at this report. And um, 5.7 million is, uh, is a number that I'll say is uh, you know, not, um, we don't think is sufficient to get us to the end of the project. Um, so we will talk a bit about that shortly. Um, with respect to the actual uh, contingency um, uh, committed as of today, um, we are at 29 million uh, remaining contingency, so um, still uh, haven't uh, haven't incurred those um, contingent costs as yet, but um, but we do forecast that we will be. Next, uh, I mentioned the uh, cost variance and the, the increased general conditions related to schedule 8.9 million, uh, then the increased cost for dewatering at 8.4, uh, a number of other um, less uh, impactful. Um, issues identified um, to uh, uh, result in the um, number that we're at. Um, with respect to soft costs, uh, the, we can go to the next slide. Um, with respect to soft, soft costs, forecast has increased again due uh, primarily to the extension of the uh, um, flood protection to mid 2024. Um, Page 183 just uh, uh, reflects, um, as we do on a regular basis, the uh, current contingency drawdowns. You can see we've got about 29 million um, uh, contingency balance as of uh, as of the end of March. Next. Um, with respect to the risk register, because we've realized some risks, uh, the overall um, uh, value of risks has decreased um, and um, the we've also reflected in, in the additional schedule time uh, in the updated schedule so the the 4.2 months of increased schedule is uh, is really not applicable given that uh, the schedule is already reflecting um, the um, extended amount of time uh, to get the project completed next so um, as we've reported in the past, there is, uh, you know, we're, we're reporting current uh, probability um, as well as the um, value calculated, which would uh, uh, provide a probability of 75% uh, likelihood. So the um, probability uh, or the, the budget estimate, if you would, um, that would result in a 75% probability is 1.2 zero eight million uh, that's an increase of about 17.3 million uh, the probability of achieving the uh, project um, within the 1.185 uh, uh, billion dollar uh, budget uh, has decreased from 53 percent to four percent um, and what that means is the probability of going over the 1.185 um, has increased fairly substantially in the last um, six months um, base costs have increased by 25 million, um, uh, offsetting uh, the risk, uh, the cost um, risk from the risk register. So that's uh, that item. Next, and this is just this table just provides uh, some of that detail. So what it uh, what we indicate here in the second last column um, is the uh, uh, revised. Um, budget at or the, the revised forecast uh, to achieve 75% at 1.2808 million. Uh, the probability of achieving budget at uh, currently at 4% uh, forecast contingency available at 5.7 million. And then um, you know additional contingency calculated to um, uh, get us to that 75% confidence level um, for for the budget. So we can go to the next slide. Um, just in terms of risk, so the uh, the top cost risks remain um, uh, the, the risk of um, increases due to uh, inflation and escalation. Um, so until we get through 100% of the uh, uh, tendering, um, we're still um, seeing that uh, potential risk. 
um, and we uh, that's why I say we hope, we expect to get that uh, uh, risk um, identified or com concluded by this fall. Uh, and then there remain uh, uh, fairly there remains a fairly high risk related to um, the uh, soil uh, remediation, soil uh, reuse, and soil disposal, um, reflecting a, a probable. Um, or a potential cost of about 10 million plus or minus um, related to those uh, soil costs. Next, with respect to um, the schedule, so we are currently forecasting substantial completion of flood protection um, in June of 2024 um, with parks um, substantial completion, so the completion of uh, planting in October following the fall planting season and then overall close out of the project um, in December um, concurrent with the uh, substantial completion of the Lakeshore Boulevard project. Uh, with respect to the next slide schedule risks, these risks are um, not risks that affect the um, uh, or are expected to <coughs> affect the um, sorry the um, overall schedule. They may affect the individual elements of this uh, or individual project elements that they identify um, here, but we don't expect they'll uh, they'll impact the overall delivery and uh, substantial completion date. Um, should they be realized, then they may not be. Um, with respect to so, um, so that's the background. That's the information. I think we, what we wanted to do now is just to uh, provide a bit of uh, context and background for um, for the information that we're reporting uh, today. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. We have done a um, an analysis of really, you know, where have the biggest um, impacts been from a uh, on the contingency. So you know, what are the what are the issues and um, elements that have um, consumed the contingency that we had. And we started with the contingency of, uh, you know, uh, about uh, well, 20 percent um, with uh, escalations of about 10 percent. So overall, you know, 30. Uh, well, based on based on calculations and, you know, uh, the contingency or sorry, the escalation rates between 2017 and or 2016 and um, and today, uh, escalation costs or the cost of escalations and, and inflation has been about 85 million higher than the number we originally carried for escalation. And essentially, we you know we forecast escalation um, using the same numbers government typically does at two percent. Um, escalation has been more than twice that um, uh, over the course of the project. And of course, we weren't. You know that the budget that we had and the funding that we had wasn't marked to market. It wasn't. Uh, there was no. You know, beyond the specific numbers that we carried, there was no ability um, or, or provision to increase that based on um, how uh, how the market and the economy went. So that's the biggest single hit um, on on the contingency. And, and, and you know, that this is not all related to COVID, but a very large part of it is related to COVID. Um, over the last couple of years, you know, where you know there's. 6.9% inflation now and uh, and certainly over during COVID we've had issues related to um, commodity pricing um, as well as uh, availability of materials um, that have uh, uh, contributed to this. Um, ground improvements substantially um, uh, greater requirement to ground improve um, uh, roads and services than originally forecast, um, and uh, including um, you know costs for ground improvements for parks and public realm areas, um, the accommodation of the uh, Gardner Expressway. So the interim, uh, the work that we've done to uh, essentially achieve flood protection while not impacting on the Gardner um, to DVP ramps, uh, just over 15 million. Um, we have utility cost sharings. We're cost sharing. We forecast that. Um, uh, or estimated that the work would be uh, conducted under the um, terms of the Public Service Works on Highways Act. That's not how it uh, developed. So there are um, costs both for Toronto Hydro and Enbridge um, in the uh, just over again 15 million um, that have uh, been absorbed. Um, there have been some delay costs um, that have now been reflected in the uh, in the estimate of completion, um, both for our, um, uh, construction and consulting costs, about 10 million. Um, 
there is the uh, Enbridge pipe over the Don River. We had actually originally budgeted um, no money for that project because we didn't expect that pipe would be there when we started construction. However, as you remember, you recall Enbridge pulled their initial um, um, request or their initial proposal to remove that pipe um, once um, we started talking to them about uh, the portlands. Um, there was the contribution uh, to um, uh, TPLC for uh, one of the studio relocations and then just some others, the fire hall purchase and improvements. Um, initially, we were um, simply going to be relocating a, a, a structure um, owned by uh, a private entity, but it was, the decision was made that you know, having a private um, private landowner in the middle of a public park was not the uh, appropriate way to proceed. Um, and then uh, some additional costs and, and our, our direct costs for COVID um, have been fairly um, insubstantial or um, immaterial at, uh, at around $2 million. Um, and so I think we've, you know, we've fared better than maybe some other projects in that regard. Um, but we've obviously been impacted by the overall um, impact of COVID on the um, economy. So that's a total of 185 million and that those really, you know, um, dozen or so elements are uh, and were um, effectively completely out of our control um, to um, either um, forecast or mitigate. Um, and uh, you know, so we've, uh, there are other issues obviously um, on site, site conditions, um, uh, design issues that um, have also consumed um, and been um, uh, handled through the uh, contingency, uh, but these are the um, primary um, elements. Next. And please stop me at any time if you have questions. This is just some uh, analysis that was done, um, worked with um, with uh, BTY and our um, cost consultant to look at the uh, um, escalation. Uh, province point out, you know, escalation has is, is hit the uh, residential market probably higher than the commercial. It doesn't mean the commercial market has been uh, um, uh, immune to it by any stretch. Um, but uh, as of you know, October of last year, BTY has indicated that uh, uh, you know escalation has um, the real escalation has actually amounted about 36 uh, percent since uh, 2017, and, and uh, um, you know we've taken a fairly conservative um, number and said there's about an 85 million dollar, 80 to 85 million dollar um, additional cost. But in fact, it um, you know it, it could have been and it could be substantially higher than that. It's really difficult to calculate that number. Uh, next, George has his hand up. Do you want to jump in here, George? George, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know what? Um, I just want to just uh, touch on two things. One is, um, as David said, we've tried to address as many of the efficiencies as possible. And as the project is coming closer to the end, we have less uh, opportunities to minimize the impact of these costs. Uh, BTY uh, will speak to the fact that, you know, we've seen this throughout all the uh, various sectors. And uh, we've been in touch with Metrolinx, IO, uh, the ministries, all their projects have gone actually uh, even above our escalation. Um, but we are trying to continue to look at mitigating. So we met with Ellis Dawn um, and with a variety of other players to look at each of the opportunities and each of the pressures. The intent is to come back to government once um, and we have enough uh, liquidity to get us through to next year and we want to wait till we get through the elections and we have better numbers so that we ask for an extension uh, probably to the end of next year, um, which we need because uh, the original uh, agreement goes to March 31st of next of 2024. Sorry, uh, we'll have to go to the end of 2024. And then we will by by next year, we'll have a better assessment of what that pressure is. So timing wise, we're going to continue to report to you, but we're not going to ask governments until probably um, beginning or middle of next year. Right. Okay. Um, just a bit more background. Um, just uh, and George just mentioned this. You know, through, throughout the project, we have been right from the very beginning. Um, uh, you know, working to optimize the design. So you know, where where we've. Uh, you know, work very diligently not to incur um, and uh, utilize contingency or allocate contingency was from a, uh, in, in the design um, while meeting our design excellence mandate. 
um, and the requirements of the uh, scope of the project and, and um, city requirements from a, uh, an asset design perspective, um, we have been um, right from the very beginning and continue to um, implement and uh, assess and implement uh, optimizations to the design to ensure that uh, um, we're, we're building, designing and building as economically as we possibly can. Next. Um, just in terms of context, uh, uh, the <coughs> board approved strategic plan provides um, um, performance metrics uh, for the organization. Um, number four on those uh, key performance um, metrics it relates to um, uh, project delivery and um, uh, four point uh, two and four point three specifically. Um, Note that um, you know projects sh uh, are to be completed, or are, are you know from a from a performance perspective should be completed um, uh, at or below 105 percent of original budget. In the case of um, the Portlands, that would equate to a 62.5 million dollar um, um, escalation, if you will. Um, it's a large money and we still need to find the funding for that or a large amount of money. We still need to find the funding for that. But from a performance perspective, um, it is, you know, uh, up to that number is within the uh, range of um, performance expectations. And from a schedule perspective, it's um, similarly less than or equal to six months um, of schedule extension from the original. And um, we uh, anticipate, as I said, uh, flood protection achievement by um, June of uh, or middle of 2024 um, uh, as related to the, um, uh, the contribution agreement uh, date of March 31st, 2024 uh, that, that George mentioned. OK, next. So uh, and George also mentioned that there um, uh, our strategy to uh, we we met we are looking at establishing um, with Ella Stone and the consulting team uh, you know uh, we've reassessed or continued to assess the risks associated with um, uh, delivery of the project for example um, the risks uh, on schedule and budget or impacts on schedule and budget from the uh, strikes that have um, happened over the last month um, we've you know, needed to begin to assess those because that is not a risk that was included in our risk register um, from a cost or schedule perspective. Um, we uh, so we've done a, a deep dive, uh, a further deep dive on all of the risks. And what we're trying to establish is, you know, what is the um, minimum likely amount of um, additional cost uh, related to those risks? What is the maximum likely amount? So if every risk was incurred at the maximum cost of you know forecast of that risk. What would that number be? And then we will do a uh, another Monte Carlo um, cost probability assessment and really try to try to bookend um, where we expect or where we think the, the budget may go. And over the course of the next six months, uh, really refine that so that we've got a number that we're we're comfortable with. And George made the point that we're not you know we do not want to. Um, uh, come back to governments, come back to the board more than once. So we want to be very comfortable with the number that we uh, come back with in terms of where we expect to uh, expect to be in um, in the fall. It'll be around December when we uh, report back to the board. Um, and um, I think that is, yeah, that is it. So questions. So, so David, I, um, in the interest of time, um, you guys done a good job of explaining where we're at, why we're there, what you've done to mitigate it. Um, I think we can have some more dialogue in, in closed session on this. Uh, I'd like to move to the BTY yep. report at this point to get there, and then we as a committee can assess it and have further dialogue in the in the closed session. So I'm not sure, is it Luis? Uh, Luis is on, should be on, yeah. Be there, Luis? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear so, First of all, it's actually it's great, David. You, you you were before me because you actually uh, gave a great explanation about many things that I was going to talk. So it actually um, doesn't make sense to repeat a couple of things. So I just want to focus on a couple of things. For this period, we actually divided our analysis or uh, put a lot of effort and focus in two different areas. One was the schedule and the other one was uh, the cost. So uh, talking about the schedule, as David mentioned, um, 
there is a new baseline and actually the project has been revised in terms of the duration of certain activities and challenges that have been actually coming in the last few months. So we actively uh, participated in meetings and tried to see what um, Ellis Don actually had to report and try to advise um, David and his team on a couple of activities. So we're really happy with what came, although we have to say that this is this still needs to be monitored constantly to see that the dates that are proposed now are achievable or not. On your side is the budget wise. So as uh, you guys heard, there are potentials of cost increases due to the extension of the schedule and additional challenges that are on site right now. We have been monitoring those challenges and have been in constant communication with uh, Davis team to see and analyze and understand what's going on. Uh, right now, as you saw the recent analysis provided by, by, by David, there is a potential to increase the budget. Um, contingency, unfortunately, have been used significantly in this last period to offset costs that have been increased in different areas and different projects. So part of the revision that has to be made and part of the recommendation that we actually have given is to check uh, about those possible increases. And I know there are a couple of groups. Uh, I have been invited to a couple of calls in the next few days to discuss about uh, budget and about possible costs and estimate of completion is to realize what is needed. From our side, we will keep monitoring and reporting to you guys. As you see in our report, we have an extensive analysis of the of what's going on in terms of cost, what has been used, how the contingency has been used so far. And we keep on reporting on the main challenges that we see right now. As David mentioned, cost escalation has been significant all across uh, the country in different projects. We have been involved in different projects in infrastructure and certainly uh, it's huge what has actually uh, how projects have increased from 2020 to now. Then a uh, recommendation to us is just pretty much check and monitor uh, what's needed uh, from now on and we are open and happy to participate if we are required to provide an opinion on what it needs to be done to assess uh, this potential additional cost. In terms of the schedule, as he mentioned, uh, we we actively work on that. So the new dates, um, we, I'm honest with you, uh, I don't understand the process for you guys to approve or not approve dates, but at least what we have been recommending to Davis team is to the best of our opinion, what should be done in terms of controlling and monitoring at least done in certain activities. Um, I get that from our side. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. I'll be happy to answer. Questions for BTY? Anyone on the phone? Any hands up? Okay. Thanks. That's good. Good presentation. I think Thank you, you all understand where we're at. Thanks, BTY. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take the annual insurance program review as read. There's some additional costs. We'll, talk, we'll deal with those in the closed session. Um, any other business rising out of the open session before we? Hearing none, um, can I get a motion to go into closed session? Janie? Okay. I think there's three of them. Three. Minutes, fees, and IAR. Minutes, fees, and the uh, integrated report. Um, there. There's the three. They're all there for us to, to read. Can I do it under one motion to accept all three? Um, <laughs> no. Do it one at a time. Jeannie's going to do the first, do the first one. one, Drew, and Drew, you're going to do the second one. And Michael, as his last act, is going to move the third one. Got all that? All in favor? Any opposed? Those are all carried. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank Great you. meeting. Great, Great update on where we're at.